Uh, well, I think the last two weeks have, have been a real blessing for us as a church, and I especially want to thank uh, Paul and Dan, um, who spoke over the last two weeks. Uh, uh, behind the scenes, they have put an enormous amount of, of reading and reflection and prayer, uh, really um, digging into this series so that we might be served well uh, to understand the challenges that this topic throws, out, throws up for us. So um, I really want to honour uh, Dan and Paul for their work on this series. Um, Dan started with a story of something he'd made. He made this, this fist, uh, kind of like a, a model. Um, Paul shared a story of something that uh, had broken his uncle's camera that kind of smashed to pieces. And so I thought, this morning, I'll start with something that I fixed. Um, and so here we are. This is, um, this is me with my first ever car, a glorious machine, um, the 1984 Toyota Corolla. Um, it was a great vehicle. Uh, it did have some, some issues. It was quite old even when I got it. Um, the strapping under the driver's seat had all kind of like perished and come apart. And so the, the driver's seat kind of sank down. So when you sat on it, it's like sitting on a toilet with no toilet seat. And you just kind of sunk into the floor. And so I thought, oh, I can fix that. Uh, and so I shoved a couple of phone books underneath and kind of propped it up. It wasn't very comfortable, but fixed it uh, fine. Now, uh, for you teenagers, a phone book is like... <laughs> it's like an encyclopedia... Um, an encyclopedia of phone numbers that they printed out and delivered to every house in Australia every year. Can you believe that? Um, now, an encyclopedia uh, is like, it's like Wikipedia, um, but in book form. So, there's a lot to explain there. Um, the, the window of the, the driver's door um, kind of fell off its runner and fell into the door, so it kind of like stuck down. So again, I, I, had to, I jimmied that up and I, I wedged some paper in there. A lot of these fixes are paper-based. Um, so I, I fixed the window, just shoving, uh, so wedged up a piece of paper in there. Um, I even installed a new stereo system in my car, and, but I found that, you know, because I kind of found it from somewhere, it wouldn't fit in the space. And so I thought, what I'll do is I, I folded up some old pizza boxes and I kind of wedged them in there. And that had the, the dual victory of both kind of having somewhere for my stereo to sit, but also making the car smell like pizza all the time. And so it was just the dream. I loved this car so, so much. But you have to say that for humanity, we need a different kind of fix than that. We're going to need a better solution, aren't we? We can't just patch up the old thing and keep her running. That's not going to do the job. We, we heard last week that the source of the problem is in here. It's our hearts. It's actually an independence from the God who has made us. And we want to define life our own way. And so the solution needs to be in here as well. We need a fix from within. Our series has followed uh, these three steps, origin, problem, and solution. And today we come to the solution. And for the Christian, we want to say that Christ is the solution. He is the one who fixes us from the inside, our hearts. Uh, but what we want to see today is how does that work? How is Christ the solution for the problem of humanity? And what does that mean for our lives now? That's what we want to see today. So, uh, we've seen the first two acts. We've seen how we are made by God. We've seen how we've been unmade by sin. And today we come to part three, made new in Christ. And to really see this, we need to flick forward uh, to the life of Jesus, the start of his ministry. And we get a scene similar to the one that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, but this time it is a bit different. Uh, we're not in the garden anymore. We're in the wilderness. Once again, Satan approaches the human with a temptation. Again, Satan twists God's words to tempt the human to take control for themselves. That's in Matthew 4 and, and Luke as well. Satan confronts Jesus 
It says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all be yours. That's the, that's the, the pitch of Satan to Jesus. And back in week one, Dan showed us that we are made for God, for worship. And here is Jesus facing the same temptation as the man and the woman. Not to worship God, but to take glory for himself. And look at what happens. Verse 8, Jesus answers, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Can you see Jesus here? He succeeds where uh, humans fail. He lives out our true purpose to be made for God, to worship the Lord only. He is the true human, perfectly obedient to God, perfectly oriented towards God and not himself. He comes as, as the true solution to the problem of humanity. And because he is there in human flesh, he comes in true humanity. He doesn't just show us how it's done and say, now you guys go for it. No, he's able to act for us as our representative. In his death, he takes the punishment that we deserve. And so he is able to win forgiveness, not just for himself, he does not need it, but for us. He takes our place in his death. And so God is able to solve our deepest problem by forgiving us, taking away that punishment and planting his spirit in us to give us new hearts, a new orientation towards him because of what Jesus has done. That is the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus, that he has done the thing that we couldn't do. We couldn't cleanse our own hearts because they're broken from within. But he does it for us. He lives the perfect human life but dies the ultimate sinner's death for our sake. And that's why we sing songs about him. There's, there's a whole other uh, sermon series just there looking at the humanity of Jesus, how he acts as our priest, as our king, as our substitute. And if you can only take one thing away from this morning, just remember that Jesus is the hero. He is the one who solves the problem of humanity. We are made new in Christ. But for the rest of this morning, uh, what I want us to do is actually think through uh, the implications of that. What does that mean for us now? How does that impact what it means to be a person, our identity, our purpose? And so we're going to see uh, three things that flow out of this. Uh, a new creation, a new conflict, and a new calling. Those three things. A new creation, a new conflict, and a new calling. And as we go through, I want to just uh, stop at various points and, and ask that question, what should we expect as we go through this life? What should we expect? I uh, say, so firstly, a new creation. Uh, just quickly, uh, let's do a word association test uh, just in your own heads. And when I say the phrase new creation, what is the, the picture that pops into your mind? Uh, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you, just, you hear those words and you probably think something like your mind goes to a picture of heaven, Revelation 21, 22. And that's right. When the Bible talks about the new creation, it is looking forward to eternity, to the new world that God will create when Jesus returns. And that is the future of humanity. That is where we are heading no more sin, no more brokenness, no more pain, 
No more shame and hiding. That is our future, our home. But can I say, that is not all. Because when Jesus is raised, now the Bible says that he is the first fruits of the new creation. He's the first peach of summer. He is the first model of the assembly line of the new creation. And so the new creation has begun, hasn't it? It started in Jesus. And so that means that if you are united to Jesus by faith, then the new creation has started in you as well. Uh, Listen to this. Uh, This is um, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. Um, Here's what he says. He says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Now, physically, we are not part of the new creation yet. I know that for a fact. I played basketball a couple of weeks ago. I felt the old creation coursing through my veins. But the new creation has come. It has started in us now by the Spirit. Did you know that? Colossians 3 says that we have been raised with Christ. The old you has died and your new life has started if you are in Christ. A few months back, uh, we had Steve from Compassion Australia come and and share with us a little of the work of Compassion um, that lots of us here at North Coast support. And I don't know if you remember, he showed a video uh, of a family who'd just been told that um, their child had been sponsored. And it was was a really moving video. The parents were crying, um, just so thankful that their, their, their child's life had changed by being sponsored. And the, the crazy thing was that as, as you watched the video, you could tell they, they were in a very basic heart and, and their circumstances clearly hadn't changed. Uh, the child hadn't received a single meal. Uh, in, in many ways, nothing had changed at all and yet everything had changed because now they had a relationship uh, with this sponsor. And it's like that. Jesus has restored our relationship with God. And in a way, nothing has changed. And in a way, everything has changed. We still live here with broken bodies, are struggling with sinful desires. And yet we know that everything has changed. The new creation has begun. If we are in Christ, we are made new in him. He is the hero. He is the one who makes all the difference. That's true, um, but we're not there yet. Uh, Take a look at how John puts it in 1 John 3. He says, dear friends, now we are the children of God. That has changed. That has been established. This, This new humanity has begun. Now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. Uh, The real us is still to be revealed. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Just as he is new creation now, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And so we want to ask the question, uh, given this is true, that we are now children of God, but we are not yet what we will be, uh, what does that mean for us now? And so that's the next bit. We want to see uh, that we have a new conflict, a new conflict. Uh, Growing up, um, I had uh, a friend, one of those crazy guys who was always up for everything. Nothing was too wild. Nothing was too risky for him. He was into everything. Uh, And I remember him telling me a story of what happened to him after he got engaged. Uh, So he he was telling the story. He was on a friend's farm, um, kind of just busting along on one of the farm motorbikes. 
And one of the things that he loved doing on the farm was he'd use the empty dams like a, a set of motocross jumps. He'd kind of go up one lip and into the dam and then down the other side and then out. And you have to admit that sounds pretty fun, doesn't it, to, to do that on a, on a farm? And so he, he's caning it towards this dam and he's telling me this story and he says, suddenly I start thinking. Uh, he says, I just realized I have no clue what is in that dam? You can't see in, inside it there. He says, I just realized I don't know if it's full of mud or, or it's actually got water in it. I'm just assuming it's empty. It could be some kind of like rusty old piece of farm equipment down at the bottom. And then I, I realized, wait, all, all this is kind of coursing through. He says, I, I'm engaged now. I can't, I can't do this, this anymore. And so he swerves off to the side. And he's telling me this story. He couldn't believe it. He'd never thought like this before. Uh, he was shocked with himself. Pulling out of something risky was something that he had never done in his life. And yet, now, getting engaged meant that suddenly he had conflicting motivations within him. Uh, he kind of wanted to keep doing crazy stuff, but he also wanted to, you know, like live and stuff and, and not, <laughs> not die, not injure himself <laughs> terrifically. And so there was this internal conflict that he'd introduced into his life. Getting engaged made him think differently, uh, gave him new priorities. And I think that's something of what it's like for the Christian. Um, Paul brought this up last week when we looked at Galatians 5, um, that having the, the Spirit come inside us brings a conflict. Uh, so here it is. Uh, Galatians 5, 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Inside us, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. It's very stark, isn't it? You are not to do whatever you want. You can hardly imagine anything more countercultural in this present moment than saying, no, no, don't do what you want. Do the opposite. But it makes perfect sense when you realize that the new creation has started. It's begun in us. And that introduces a new conflict for us, a battle between the flesh and the spirit who now lives inside of you if you are in Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 gives us this, the perfect summary, I think, of what's going on. It says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new, made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what it means to be human, to be made new, created by God, to be righteous. And that is the life that we are to pursue now. The old self is being corrupted. What by? By the heart, by deceitful desires. And so what action do we need to take well, we need to work on our minds to be made new in our attitudes, our thinking. Uh, like my friend who, who had to think differently once he was engaged and, and suddenly the, the way that he operated was different. We need to redirect ourselves towards God to listen to his word. We need to study the scriptures and to reshape our desires to please him and not to please ourselves. It's at once uh, very simple and the hardest thing imaginable. Because my desires don't feel deceitful to me. They feel like the real me. And I think that's the whole trick, right? Uh, they feel like the real me. Our, our sexuality our gender identity, our, our, our preferences, they, they run to the very core of, of how we feel that we are. 
And our culture says to embrace that. And it feels like we're not being authentic if we don't. But Jesus has shown us the opposite. Jesus has shown us what it means to live as a true human. To lay aside uh, your own desires and live for God. That is the way to be truly authentic as a human. Jesus was the most authentic human that ever lived. Not because he was married, not because he had a family or because he built some kind of successful business. They are not the things that define you. That's not what it means to be a human, no. Jesus lived the authentic human life because he worshipped God in obedience. That is what we are made for. That's what it means to be a person. And so we live by God's word and not our own desires, as difficult as that may be. And many of us struggle deeply with that and yet courageously listen to God and conform ourselves to God's word. And if that is you, can I say we honor you as you go through that as you live according to God's word and not your own desires. Because God's word tells us the truth about ourselves, that we have a new identity. Now you are the children of God. And so that is the new self that we are to live out. Uh, I think... Um, maybe it was last week, the week before, um, Gary Boardman pointed out that there's this new book um, coming out by Kevin DeYoung. It hasn't been released yet, and so this isn't an endorsement in any way. I haven't read it, Um, but this is the title. Uh, The title is Do Not Be True to Yourself. Uh, It's so countercultural to think as a Christian, to think this way, that we're not to be true to ourselves. Actually, ourselves, our Our desires are deceitful and will lead us away from what we are truly created to be. So given that, uh, what should we expect? Well, I think we should expect internal conflict. We should expect internal conflict. Uh, Our new conflict is not external, but it's, it's within. The conflict between the spirit and the flesh. And so can I say, if you're a Christian and you experience conflicted desires in this life, can I say yes? That's what's called the normal Christian life. That is evidence that the Spirit is at work, engaged in that battle. Can I say, keep going? And if you're a Christian here today and you experience no struggle living the Christian life, no internal dissonance when it comes to God's word, no kind of tug like God's telling me to do what? I don't want to do that. Then can I say, be careful. When was the last time you fought a battle against your own desires? The Bible says that that should be going on, a battle against greed, against that flare of anger. Please be careful that you're not just Uh, going with the flow of your own deceitful desires. We should expect internal conflict as we put the old self to death. So that's one implication. If Jesus starts a new humanity, then anyone in him faces a new conflict. The second implication, if we are a new creation, uh, it means that we now have a new calling, a new calling, uh, a new people to be. Here's what Jesus says about the people of the kingdom, this new humanity that he has started. Uh, He says um, in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. His intention is that his people would be different. You are the light of the world, he says, Uh, You are the salt of the earth. They are uh, word pictures of something that is distinctive. You can taste it. You can see it. It is obvious. 
And that is part of our calling now to live distinctive new creation lives. And so we should expect to stand out. We should expect that to look different to the culture around us. I think that's um, a real help uh, for those of you who uh, go and and work in a secular workplace uh, each and every day. Uh, I think that is is right now where we often stand out the most. Uh, That's the place where God's picture of humanity isn't shared with the people around us. And, And so we look different. And can I say... The, the, the Bible says, yes, that's normal. In fact, it's intentional. It's part of God's calling for us to, to live distinctive lives for him. But that won't be easy. Uh, we should expect to face external pressure. Uh, it's, it's really hard in, in the workplace. Uh, what happens when when being distinctive actually kind of like just puts your head up to be shot at. Where where standing apart um, could get you fired. How do you follow that call uh, to stand out without being offensive or, or, or causing harm? How do you do that in a loving way and yet to be faithful to that? Are there difficult questions and they're questions that we need to keep on grappling with together as a church family. But if you are finding uh, your workplace hard, um, with feeling that kind of pressure to conform, then I think the Bible says, uh, don't be shocked by that. That checks out. You have a new calling. God wants us to live new creation lives now. Because he has a purpose that requires us to be different. And so to finish, I want us to go all the way back to the start, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, Here's how that uh, passage goes on. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Uh, Paul goes on uh, talking to this church. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Uh, Paul sees that as his role to be Christ's ambassadors, but I think that is no less true of us. We are away from home, far from that new creation. But what that means is that now we are ambassadors. Uh, you know how that works? You know, the Australian ambassador to the US, you know, lives over in Washington, um, he's, he's there, uh, but he belongs to Australia, speaks on behalf of Australia, and that's us. Uh, we belong to the new creation. That's our future. That is our eternity, but we are here now, and God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation that God offers to make people new in Christ. That's the message that we have. We don't have a message of morality. Uh, We don't have a message of social norms that we think everyone should follow and get on board with. No. Our message isn't uh, about particular views on gender or sexuality. It is so much more than that. We are ambassadors with a new creation message that God is reconciling this broken world back to himself in Christ through that perfect human. And that one day he will bring about that perfect new humanity, free of conflict, free of any internal dissonance, free of shame and hiding 
free of tears, even free of death. And that is the real story that we need to share with each other. And that is the message that we have to share with the world around us. The message that God is making us new in Christ. Why don't we pray for each other as we go from here. That God would do that work in us and uh, make us ambassadors for that message. Let's pray. Father God, in your great kindness, you have made us in your image. Uh, bearers of your image. Uh, made for relationship. Relationship with you and, and made for worship. Father, we're sorry and we acknowledge that we have um, not lived your way. That we have um, uh, broken your word, that we've turned to our, our own desires. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he has come to make all things new. And we praise you that even now we can uh, have your spirit within us through the work of Jesus. Father, we know that we struggle to live that out. And so we pray that your spirit would work powerfully. Please change us to desire the things that you love, to put to death the old self and live new creation lives now. And we pray, Father, that you would make us godly, holy, faithful ambassadors. Please give us opportunity to hold out uh, that message of reconciliation to the world around us. Uh, and Father, please would you keep us uh, to that task until your son returns, and we pray in his name. Amen.